Open up your Bible, please, to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. We've been studying through the Gospel of John on Wednesday, or Sunday mornings, and on Wednesday nights we're studying through the book of Revelation. And then on Sunday afternoon we've been studying the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, one of the things we're going to look at this afternoon is that there were some young people and they were mocking the prophet of God because he was bald. And uh, the Lord sent she-bears to uh, tear up these young people, these teenagers who were mocking the Lord. And many of them were killed and uh, hurt. And uh, it's amazing some of the things you find in the Bible. But we're going to look on that. We're going to see how the Holy Spirit works all through the Old Testament. And uh, we've come to the book of uh, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. And we're dealing with some in Kings as well. So we hope you can come this afternoon. But this morning now, in John 13, we're going to look at a couple verses. And uh, we're going to study uh, love, mutual love, brotherly love, uh, the importance of love. Jesus says in verse 34, A new commandment I give unto you. A new commandment I give unto you. What is that commandment? That you love one another. That you love one another. Now, remember in the, the Greek language, we have several words that mean love. We have brotherly love. We have erotic love. We have the kind of love that God is talking about here, and that's agape love. Agape love means that it is not if love, it's not because of love, it's in spite of love. There are many people in the world will love you if you do this, this, and that. Or they'll love you because of this, this, and that. But very few people will love you in spite of all the failures and faults and simply love you with the love of God. That's God's love. And that's the way we're commanded to love each other with agape love. He says, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. Now remember, just before this, he had washed the disciples' feet. And they didn't know what to think about that, but he sat them all down, explained to them what it meant to be a servant, and then he started taking off their sandals and cleaning the sand and grit and dirt uh, from their feet. Kind of like, you know, when you, when you go to the beach and you, you put on shoes and you think you're going to keep your shoes all free from sand, and you start walking on the beach, and the next thing you know... Uh, I took my shoes off at home and there was a big pile of white sand in our living room. I don't know how I took I brought them all the way on the plane and everything, brought that sand home. And so those disciples would have had sandy, dirty feet. And Jesus took off the sandals, He girded Himself, and He got on His knees and He washed their feet. And He told them that this should be the way that they should treat each other. That you love each other. You know, the one thing that a church ought to be known for is love. If we're known for anything, it should be we're known because of our love. Now this next verse is quite an, uh, an example because Jesus says, By this, what is that? By the love that you have for one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. One of the missing ingredients in most all of Christianity today is love. People just don't understand it. They uh, that people just uh, draw a blank when it comes to love. When somebody does something kind for you or someone puts you before themselves, a lot of people just don't understand it. 
Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whether I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Because the Lord was saying that he was going to die and he was going to go to the Father. And later on, Peter would die and follow him. But right now, Peter could not come. And Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. And what the Lord was doing is he was wanting Peter to understand how frail he was. You know, we may think that we're spiritual. We may think that we're really strong. But Jesus is demonstrating here, Peter, that before this cock is going to crow, you're going to deny me three times. And when the cock crowed, Peter remembered that he had been the one who said, that he would follow Jesus. The changing power of the gospel is very evident when you look at the lives of the first century Christians. I remember when, when I first got saved, I played on the uh, Boonville Bullet softball team. and We traveled all around the country playing softball. I was the shortstop. And... Uh, I knew all those guys had grown up with them, but I never really loved them. And after I got saved and began to read the Bible, God put a love in my heart. And I would, when I would talk to the players, I would tell them I loved them. And they'd look at me real strange, like I was, you know, like there's something wrong with them. And I said, no, I genuinely love you. And I want you to be saved, and I want you to know the Christ I know. And all through my life, I have told people I love you, and I truly mean it. It's not just words, because God puts it in your heart. And when you love someone, and you share that love, and you show that love, it's something that Satan cannot reproduce. Satan is, is completely unable to replicate the love that God puts in our hearts. One of the first century martyrs uh, was a man named Justin Martyr. And uh, he wrote in the first century, and he said this, We want to value above all else money and possessions, but now we bring together all that we have and share it with everyone who's in need. Formerly, we hated and killed one another because of a difference in nationality or customs. But now, since of the grace of Christ, we live in peace. We pray for our enemies, and we seek to convert those who hate us. How true that is. Before I was saved, I didn't know what love was about. I didn't understand the power of love. And just as Justin Martyr wrote here about how he was before he got saved and what happened afterwards. Tertullian, one of the second century uh, uh, church historians, wrote, It is our care for the helpless our practice of loving kindness that brands us in the eyes of our opponents, they say, only look how they love one another. Only look how they love one another. You see, as a child of God, we need to rely upon one another for strength and encouragement. One of the great blessings of, of our church is how much love there is in our church and how much love people show it. I mean, it's just amazing. We have folks who come to visit and they'll say, I've never seen love like that, shown like that. I've, we've had pastors come and preach and they call me later and they say, that's the most loving church that I've ever seen in my life. 
people hugging each other, telling each other they love each other, and showing it by their lives. You see, the world looks at that, and they don't understand. I was reading a story, a true story, about the USS Pueblo that was captured by the North Koreans. And they had 82 men that survived. And they went into brutal captivity. And the North Koreans, when it comes to captivity, there's nobody who tortures and hurts more than the North Koreans. And these men were in, in captivity. And every day they would sit at tables. And all of a sudden, after hours of sitting, a North Korean would slam through the doors and he would take his rifle and start beating the man who was at the front chair. And he would beat him until he was unconscious and he would collapse in the floor. Day one that happened. Day two that happened. Day three that happened. And on the fourth day, there was a man there who was a Christian and he said if he does it to him today, he'll die. So I'm going to take his place. So when they all gathered around their seats, he slipped into this man's seat. And sure enough, at the same hour, the North Korean came in and started beating him with his, pist his uh, uh, rifle and beat him unconscious. And so every day, you know what those men would do? They would all take turns. And they would each one take their place in that chair and be beat until they were unconscious. Now that's, that's love, isn't it? Most people would never agree to do something like that. But this, this Christian man taught them that love is so important. And Jesus said, By this shall all men know. Now if you underline in your Bible, underline that word know. And that, that's a word that's used many times in the Bible. And it's a word that means to know something by experience. To know something. Many times when, when I try to witness to people, I try to do kind things for them. One young man that I tried to witness to for a number of years, uh, he had an interest in guitars. And so I would go and buy him a set of guitar strings. And I'd go by his house and I'd give them to him. And he'd say, well, let me pay you. I'd say, no, I don't want no pay. He'd say, well, let me trade you something. I'd say, no, I don't want nothing. I'm just giving it to you. And I did that several times, and I gave him other stuff. And he said, I kept wondering when you were going to say, now you owe me something. But you never did. And he said, I never saw that kind of love. I had people love me like that. Richard Adams who's gone on to be with the Lord before I was saved. He would do things for me. He would give me things. He would show love to me and out of the kindness of his heart. And it caused God uh, to begin to work in my life because I realized how important it is. By this shall all men know by experience, gnosko, that you are my, what? My disciples. If you have love, if you have love one toward another. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about love. Uh, the kind of love that the Lord is talking about produces a strong Christian witness. This kind of love will make a church strong. It will make people strong and courageous. It is very important. The world will judge us and will look at our lives and will either be turned on or turned off by the way we see love, they see love manifested in our lives. In the book of 1 John, I'd like you to turn there for a moment. Uh, 1 John chapter 3, it's toward the back of your New Testament. 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. You read that? 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. 
we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. One of the proofs that you will know that God is in your heart is that you will love people. You will love those that you at one time could not love. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer hath ever eternal life abiding in him. That is, someone who has sheer hatred and would try to take another one's life out of hatred, that person does not know the love of God. We see that in, in our world, many people will backbite and they will talk about each other and say hurtful things, but the child of God is encouraged to never be a part of that. Never backbite and devour one another because the world will be looking at your life. And 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15 make it very clear. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Do you love people? Is there a love that you can't explain or you can't understand that God has put in you for people? Or are you full of hatred? You see, if you're full of hatred, then you've never passed from death unto life. God puts love in our heart. Look over to 1 John chapter 4 and look at verse 20. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God loveth his brother also. There is no way to love God as we ought if we don't love our brothers and sisters. When we look out at each other, we should feel love in our hearts. Good love. The kind of love that wants the best for you. The kind of love that wants you to be blessed and to prosper and to have a long life filled with good things. We live in a world today where even men who claim to be called of God will take advantage of little children, will sexually abuse them, will allow the lust of their hearts uh, uh, to be used for a terrible thing that will injure and hurt. That's not of God. There's something wrong in the heart of a person who wants to take advantage of people rather than love people. How can we love God whom we have not seen if we cannot love our brothers who we have seen? There's an old poem that says, Living above with saints we love, well, that will one day be glory. But living below with saints we know, well, that's another story. You know, it's not so easy to love people that you know. And that's the challenge, to love them, even though they've done you wrong, even though they have taken advantage of you. You've been taken advantage of before. I've been taken advantage of before. We've had people to do us wrong before, and we cannot hold grudges and be bitter about that because we have to forgive. We find that brotherly love is, is really the theme of what uh, John is talking about. By this shall all men know. These are the characteristics. If you were to write down a list of things that you believe that we possess with love, it might be like this. One of the things we see is impartiality. We don't love based upon how a person looks or how they dress or what race they are. We simply love unconditionally. This is a principle that's taught way back in the book of Deuteronomy. Take your Bible. I want you to see this because 
it's a it's really challenged my heart. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter ten and verse nineteen, the Lord is talking to the children of Israel about how they were to love people who were strangers. He says, Love ye therefore the strangers, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. He is thy praise, he is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons, and now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, keep His charge and His statutes and His judgments and His commandments always. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children which have not known, and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, His greatness, His mighty hand, and His stretched out arm. And he goes on to talk about all the miracles that He did when He delivered them. And He told them to remember, to love the strangers, and to take care of them, and to be kind to them, because they were once the same way. Uh, our love is not to extend or be withheld because of a person's race. There's a lot of race hatred today. And many people use race as a platform to gain popularity. I think race should be something that we downplay, not upplay. Race don't matter. We are, we're all descendants from Adam and Eve. You bring it on down, we all come from Noah and his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So ultimately, we're all connected. No matter the color of your skin, whether you be red or black or white or whatever color, yellow, we are all made of one blood and we are to love all men and know that they have a soul and should be cared for. In the early years of our country, there were many who, who did not care about anybody else except for their race, and many people were slaughtered just because of their race. <clears throat> I'm friends with a young man in Rwanda, and uh, he's been telling me about the cleansing that's going on there, and they're trying to kill out all of these certain tribes and these people have to run for their lives and they live on the run uh, because of all the things that they go through and uh, no doubt in many places in this world people are not only being killed for being Christians but they're being killed because of simply being white and in our country it's almost like if you're a white person that uh, somehow you've done something wrong but it doesn't matter whether you're white or black. All lives matter. And to God, we're all His children that are saved, and He loves us and wants us to show that love. I think you'll see impartiality there. I think you'll see unselfishness there. Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine 39, that one of the things that we do is we love our neighbor the way we love ourselves. We're often more concerned about what's going on with our lives than what's going on with others. If we would treat our brothers like we would like to be treated, how much uh, and have much concern about them, look how different the world would be. I was talking to some of my, a couple of my grandchildren last night, and they were uh, they were doing some things to each other, and I stopped them. I said, now, I said, what if, what if he did that to you? Would you like that? Well, no. I said, well, why are you doing it to him? You are to treat him like you want to be treated. Do you want someone to talk mean to you? Do you want somebody to be a smart aleck? 
Do you want someone to uh, hurt you or say bad things? No, you shouldn't. So we love each other and treat each other the way we want to be treated. That's the principle that Jesus gave. So there would be impartiality and there would be unselfishness and there would be sincerity. I believe we, we find this uh, as one of the proofs that God is in our life. I'd like you to look at Romans 12 real quickly. Romans 12 and verse 9. Uh, the Bible tells us there about uh, loving each other and being kind to each other. I love the words of this. Romans 12 and verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Now listen to this. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love, in honor, preferring one another. That's putting other people before yourself. That's taking the lower seat and letting the other person take the higher position. And you do it from a heart of love. Don't let this love be uh, with dissimulation. Don't let these things separate you and cause divisions. Abhor those things that are evil. Cleave to what is good. And be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love. This is sincerity. Sincerity and truth in love. I think that when we have love in our heart, it abounds. Uh, our love abounds to others. It overflows. We were at uh, Jordan uh, last Sunday, and uh, they uh, had a song service, and then they kind of do what we did. They were around shaking each other's hands, and there was a man that was there. He's a black brother, and uh, he, he hadn't been there in a little while, and he, he mentioned after we were all shaking hands, he said, boy, I tell you, he said, this church is just full of love, isn't it? I said, yeah, it is. It's just full of love. Everybody loving each other, shaking hands. I believe our love should be fervent. It shouldn't just be enough to get by. It ought to be fervent love, burning love. The kind of love that uh, I told, I told uh, Kathy, you know, my toe was hurting me. I got in the bathtub and I got in the wrong way and my second to the littlest toe caught on the, somehow caught on the tub and it jerked my toenail nearly off. And it was hurting. And I couldn't really get down to it. And she grabbed a Band-Aid, took my shoe off, and she wrapped my toe with a Band-Aid. Now that may not mean much to a lot of people, but it meant a lot to me. When we do little things to show love, it's a great blessing to others. Fervent love. Peter tells us to be diligent, to be zealous. Love should not be taken lightly. Uh, I'd like to read 1 John 5 2. 1 John chapter 5. Verse 2, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Loving God, keeping His commandments are on that list too. Treat each other better than you would want yourself treated. Philippians 2, 3 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other, others better than themselves. Romans 12, 10 says, Be kindly affectioned to one another with brotherly love. 
How much less trouble would there be in the world if we only practice this? Galatians 6.10 says, As we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially they of the household of faith. 1 Timothy 6.18, that, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, and willing to communicate. I believe also on that list would be sharing, would be forgiving. We need to have a forgiving heart. If God held our sins against us, where would we be? We need to have also on that list kindness. Kindness is associated with this love. Ephesians 4.32 says that we're to love one another. Galatians 6.1 says that if you have this kind of love and you see someone overtaken in a fault, you try to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. I don't believe that it will be offensive. I think that we'll find reasons to overcome those things. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 8 9, Take heed, lest this liberty become a stumbling block to them who are weak. I believe that love will help us grow because it helps us to bear others' infirmities. 1 Thessalonians 5, it tells us to warn, to comfort, to support, to be patient. And we do this by encouragement. Isn't encouragement a great thing? When someone just says it's going to be okay and they, they encourage you with words that build you up. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 24 that we're to consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Now there are many examples of brotherly love and I know our time is gone, but... I want to just say a few things. Paul said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. There are many times when we love and we don't get love back, but that shouldn't mean that we should stop loving. We need to continue to love even when we don't get love back. It's very simple. Jesus has set the perfect example. He set the example that He laid down His life for me. I should have been on that cross. I should have been nailed. I should have been spit on. I should have been beaten. But Jesus took my place. And He died for me that I might live. And I'm so thankful that there was a day in my life when the love of God shined upon my heart and I saw Christ dying for me, I could see Him by the eye of faith taking my place. I could see my name written there. But He died in my place doing good. Love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. I want to leave you with this final illustration. November the 17th, 2012, a man named Michael Ellie was driving on the highway and there was a speed trap set and he was trying to uh, warn the people ahead of him that were coming this direction that there was a speed trap so he was blinking his lights. Well, there was a policeman that saw him blink his lights to warn people and he pulled him over and gave him a ticket for blinking his lights to warn someone. Well, the man didn't think he had done anything wrong. So Michael Ellie, he took it to the highest court he could take it to. And a judge in Missouri looked at the case and he said, well... The man was simply trying to get people to slow down and to do the right thing. His motive was not bad. He was doing a good thing. 
And you know what that judge did? He cleared him of all charges. Didn't give him a ticket. And I've thought about that a lot of times. You know, I, when I see a speed trap, I a lot of times will blink my light to keep people from getting a ticket. Because I, I know how it feels, you know, maybe you, you've kind of taken your eye off the road a little bit and you're kind of uh, driving a little faster and you have to pay a $200 fine. It's not very fun, is it? So the judge agreed he was doing a good thing. When we do good things for each other, it may show in different ways, but we care about what's happening in other people's lives. I love you. I truly do. And I know you love me. And I appreciate you. And you know we're going to keep on loving each other all through eternity. All through eternity. The Lord's going to be there. Love's going to be there. And that love is just going to be stronger and stronger and stronger. I want to keep loving my wife. I want to keep loving this church. I want to keep loving my children, loving my family, loving sinners. The more we have love, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. If you have love one to another, let's stand together.